Traffic on Tampa online. Uh, we still can't meet in person, so we're glad that you all are joining us today uh, online. Uh, today, we've got Dell back. Uh, for you all who remember, uh, you know, Dell is is one of the key founders of Cafe on Tampa and has been the moderator of all of our sessions. And we've finally been able to drag him out to get him back online. So Dell, say hi to everybody. Hey, Bill. Thank you for uh, pushing me on to be on. Uh, I wasn't on because I wasn't interested. Uh, but first of all, I want to thank Bill for uh, taking the initiative and in putting Cafe on Tampa online. On behalf of the board of directors and the Cafe on Tampa community, we really thank you. My reluctance was my technological uh, need to learn how to do Zoom. 66 days ago, I didn't know how to do Zoom. Now I'm doing Zoom meetings every day. So I'm happy to be back. And today we have uh, one of my favorite Tampans, Ronnie Kaikal. Ronnie is the director of the Touch and Map Library at the Tampa Bay History Center. And he's got a lot to share with us. Welcome, Ronnie. Hey, hey guys, and hello everybody out there. It's wonderful to be here, thank you. Rodney, do you want to give us a quick uh, update on, uh, you brought some slides. The idea here is not just to tell us about history, although we may geek out on that in a few minutes, but tell us about pandemics over time and, and how uh, Tampa Bay has faced pandemics before, please. Yeah, so um, so yeah, so even though this is something that we haven't as a, as a kind of living society dealt with, uh, unless you've been to Africa or some other place where they've, they've had these um, kind of pandemics more recently. Uh, this is not the first epidemic or pandemic that has come through Florida. Um, and so I have some, some images that I uh, kind of put together, we'll show in a little bit. Um, but the first pandemics that came through that we know of uh, uh, came through uh, because the Europeans brought diseases here to uh, when, they, when they first explored here in the 1500s and it devastated the native populations. It's really one of the main reasons why uh, the early North American continent uh, was almost depopulated of its original inhabitants. Uh, certainly Florida um, was- Hey, Rocky, let me ask you, I wanna yeah. ask you a question real fast and also tell everybody, if you're watching this, uh, you can ask questions, Cafe on Tampa style yeah. below the feed if you're watching on the computer, I mean, on the phone or to the right if you're watching on the computer. And, uh, and you know, please ask us questions throughout. And the idea of this is that we want to share information that not everybody has access to. So please share this on your Facebook page with your friends and family so that other people can get access to it. Rodney, before you get into those slides, also, we were having a discussion just before we started here about uh, was Ponce de Leon really the first European who landed here? <laughs> can you tell us a little bit yeah. about that? You have a new map since you're the yeah. curator. You have a new map that's coming that proves that he probably was not, right? Yeah, yeah. So I appreciate you uh, kind of setting me up on this. So yeah, we're we acquired recently a uh, a map from 1511. It's called the Peter Martyr Map. Uh, it was in a book that was published by Peter Martyr in, in the year 1511, and it is a a map, really the first printed map of the Caribbean, but it's also the first printed map that shows any uh, portion of Florida. It shows South Florida and the Florida Keys. And 1511 is two years before Ponce de Leon uh, came to what we know as Florida and named Florida. And so it was uh, identified as, as Bimini on the map and that's what he was looking for. So it's very clear that the Europeans knew about uh, the, the Florida landmass and, and likely had visited Florida before Ponce de Leon. And does that map say Bimini on it? Yeah. And so the, um, the uh, it says it in the description on the, the, the reverse side, uh, there's a, a pretty thorough description of the map. And the thing is, is this, the Spanish um, hierarchy did not want this information out. And so the reason why this map is incredibly rare is the King of Spain recalled all of Martyr's books and had that page removed from, from that book before they could be reissued. And then it was uh, republished in 1515 without that map. So there are only a handful of these printed maps that are still available. And uh, there's a collector in Chicago who donated it to the History Center um, because of our, our, our map collection and the importance of our collection to the map world and because of the importance of that map to the map world. Uh, so we are reason? thrilled to have that. What was the reason Sorry, for no? removing the map? So the Spanish didn't want the um, the other uh, European powers to know what they knew. And you know, Spain basically had everything to the west of what was called the line of Tordesillas. And so uh, the Pope basically split uh, the Western Hemisphere and the Atlantic Ocean, Western Atlantic in half. Half went to Spain, half went to Portugal, which is why Brazil is Portuguese. Um, but as the Spanish explored, they didn't want the information of that exploration 
uh, to become knowledge because then more people would want to go, particularly other European countries, the Portuguese in particular, the Dutch, uh, French, and English. And so, um, so any information that got out uh, was like a national secret getting out. And so Martyr should have known that. He was actually a, um, pretty high in the Spanish court. He's lucky he didn't lose his life over it. Um, but uh, again, as a result, th that life, that, I mean, that, that map became very rare. Yeah, we'll have to geek out some more about maps in a minute, but why don't you show us your yeah. picture and tell us about sure. uh, the pandemic also. Sure, sure. So yeah, so we, we can maybe do a whole nother one of these with the, um, with the, um, the martyr map. But let me, let me get to where I got to go here. Um, yeah, one of the interesting things, uh, you know, Tom Touchton helped me buy some uh, maps from his, uh, his uh, dealers. And they're not as expensive as you might think, although he's got some very expensive ones. And maps really tell a story. Um, and, and I think they're at the History Center because of the collection that he and his wife donated. I think it's the, what is it, the largest collection of Florida maps in the world? It's, yeah, it's the largest single collection of, of Florida maps uh, that are now in, in, um, in, in, you know, kind of institutional hands. You can't um, go to any reputable art uh, uh, antique map dealer in the world and mention Florida and they don't know who Tom Touchton is. That's, that's <laughs> yeah, they all, know, they all know who Tom is for sure. Um, and so, yeah, and definitely interrupt me anytime um, as I go through these. But um, as I was saying, so the, the, the first epidemics to really sweep through the, uh, the U.S. and Florida that we know of um, occurred when the Europeans arrived in the 1500s. There undoubtedly were epidemics uh, that were endemic to North America prior to that, but we just don't know about them. And so, um, but the ones that we have knowledge of. And so this, this is a, an engraving uh, from 1591 uh, showing Florida in 1564. Uh, the French did come to Florida um, and try and start a settlement. And so this is uh, some of the kind of healing practices of the, the Native Americans in Florida. Um, and, and one could speculate throughout uh, the eastern part of what is now the U.S. Um, tobacco smoke was, was thought of as healing, um, as was bleeding, which is something that Europeans as well uh, thought was, was healing to some degree. Um, of course, there, they didn't have though the the, the uh, remedies to smallpox and the other um, diseases that did run through, and so you know upwards of ninety percent of the native population was was decimated by these diseases. Uh, fast forwarding a bit through a lot of time, uh, going to the eighteen hundreds, and the 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 real problem epidemics that came through Florida in the eighteen hundreds, particularly the the after the Civil War when people began moving to Florida, uh, was yellow fever. And so this is a, a drawing from a national magazine called Leslie's Illustrated Magazine. And it's from 1870 during one of the, the, uh, the worst yellow fever epidemics to sweep Florida. And you see the, you know, the figurative character uh, called Yellow Jack, which is a nickname for, for yellow fever, of literally pulling Florida embodied in this woman uh, into a grave. And you can see next to that also going into the grave is the word trade. And so showing not only that there is a, a human um, cost to yellow fever, but also an economic cost. And we're seeing that today, of course, with COVID-19, the, the economic impact that the epidemic has on us as a society, as well as the medical. Um, and then you have Colombia, which is, you know, the United States coming to trying to come to Florida's aid uh, to some degree. But at that point, there was no aid, really. There, there was, the, the government spending wasn't nearly what it is today. Um, there, there, there was no even knowledge of what caused yellow fever. Um, they, they associated it with, with the summer months, uh, the wet season, and with, with kind of swampy conditions. Uh, but they didn't realize it was mosquitoes that carried yellow fever. Um, and, but, and so in the absence of, of that kind of knowledge, uh, people would burn tar in the streets. Uh, they would try and fumigate the mail. Uh, there were quarantines, uh, pretty serious quarantines. Uh, there would be people who would be trying to um, take a train someplace and there would be an, an armed uh, militia who wouldn't let them off the train at certain places where there was no yellow fever, but they were in fear of it. And so th there were a lot of the things that we, uh, we fear going on um, happening back then, you know, happening quite a bit back then. Uh, one thing that we're I think, talking about today, uh, assuming that um, having, a, having the, have a, had COVID-19, you'll have an immunity to it. That was certainly the case with yellow fever. And so the state health department issued health certificates to survivors of yellow fever, uh, like this one here. 
and uh, it showed that the person carrying it had yellow fever and they were no longer a threat. And this one signed by Dr. John uh, P. Wall, uh, who was uh, a Tampa guy, Tampa doctor, um, the, uh, uh, I believe father actually of, of Charlie Wall, the gangster. Um, and, and Wall was one of those first physicians who actually did speculate that mosquitoes carried yellow fever. Uh, but having one of these health certificates was very important because it meant that you could go through any quarantine lines or most quarantine lines and had kind of free mobility because it certified that you'd actually had yellow fever. And so uh, the, the last yellow fever epidemic to, to really sweep through Tampa was the 1887, 1888 between the yellow fever season. And that was a really important time. The railroad had arrived in Tampa, the cigar industry had arrived in Tampa and Tampa was really growing as a city. There were around 2000 people in the city at the time up from around 700 in 1880. And during this epidemic, um, there are around 1700 cases of yellow fever and around 150 deaths. So in a population of 2000, having that many deaths is, is pretty appalling. And so um, it's one of those things that while we obviously need to be very careful and, and be mindful of, of the rules we should follow today, um, the numbers that people faced back then were just astonishing compared to what we're facing today. Uh, Oaklawn Cemetery in downtown, in downtown Tampa uh, has an area which, which was a mass grave for yellow fever patients because they, um, they did not want to spend a lot of time um, with funerals. They wanted to get the, the dead buried as fast as possible. So they had uh, there's this mass grave in Oakland for yellow fever victims. Uh, sorry about the quality of this, uh, this image, but um, even if the yellow fever had been uh, tamed, uh, they still had quarantine stations. Uh, of course, Tampa is a port of entry and has been for a long time. And this was a quarantine station at Egmont Key. And so quarantining uh, people coming in was still a very important practice even in, in the early 1900s. And so that's when this, uh, this photograph uh, would have been taken. And so the, um, they were actually, uh, in addition to the quarantine stations, there were um, isolation hospitals throughout the state in the early 1900s because smallpox was still an issue, um, but not nearly an issue as uh, the Spanish flu. And so there's still kind of what they called so-called Spanish flu. Um, didn't originate in Spain, but the, Spain was the first country, country to um, really announce a lot of cases. And so it became associated with Spain. And so 1918 and 1919, we've heard a lot about the Spanish flu, uh, but that swept through um, in two major phases in, um, in 1918 and then recurring in the winter of 1918, 1919. And so I just have a few newspaper stories and a couple of pictures to show uh, that relate to this. And you read these articles and there's just some incredible similarities to what uh, people went through 100 years ago and what we're going through today. Um, closing schools, uh, wearing masks, uh, limiting, you know, the hours of, of work uh, and quarantines. Uh, they didn't shut the economy down to the scale that that, that has happened um, with COVID-19, but, um, but for them, it was an incredible uh, adjustment to make, just like for us now. But one thing that made this worse was the world had just finished World War I, and that also is, is one of the reasons why it spread so quickly, because you had all these soldiers uh, together who'd never been that far away from home and moving around and then coming back to, to, to their home country. Um, and so like a place like Tampa that had experienced the loss of the, the Coast Guard cutter Tampa with a um, you know, hundred or so sailors aboard, including uh, a few dozen Tampans aboard in September of 1918, then to have the influenza epidemic, it was really, really difficult for the area to, to bear that. Um, and then again, from a number standpoint, um, in October, November of 1918, which was uh, kind of one of the peaks of the, of the epidemic, uh, in Tampa alone, you had 283 uh, fatalities from the Spanish flu. So it was a really bad, bad epidemic. And unlike COVID-19, as, as far as we know, um, which generally hits the, hits the elderly the hardest, uh, the Spanish flu or the 1918, 1919 flu epidemic hit younger people the worst. And so you had um, not only a hard hit from the war with young people, particularly young men, but you also had this flu epidemic that affected the young uh, particularly uh, severely. Uh, another shot, this is a, a Tampa, um, letting the Tampa flu. Um, there's a person here who is the first Tampa fatality. He actually died though in New York, not in Tampa. Um, uh, again, people, you know, restrictions, 
there actually were no laws about spitting on the sidewalk. And this is actually when laws about spitting on in public were uh, introduced uh, to help curb the um, epidemic. Apparently spitting was quite a problem uh, in the turn of the 20th century. And so there's a story about this guy who got out of control at a place called Tibbet Brothers, which was a, um, a store on Franklin Street in downtown Tampa. And then this ad really caught my eye uh, for those uh, watching and recognize the name Moss Brothers. Uh, Moss Brothers was really the department store in, in Tampa uh, for you know, close to a hundred years. And so they put an ad in the paper uh, saying that they're closing early to, to comply with the, the orders that were going on in the day. And then- Ron, it's kind of interesting. Um, you said in the fall of uh, 1918 about 283 people passed away. Uh, that's about, and I don't really know the exact number, I should before I bring this up, about the number of people from Tampa Hillsborough County that lost their lives in World War I. Uh, and there was a monument built in Tampa for this, uh, sort of, uh, the, this uh, citizens of lost their, actually two monuments, they mm -hmm. still exist. Was there any type of monument or acknowledgement of the citizens that lost their lives during this influenza? Uh, as far as I know, no. And so those monuments you mentioned, Del, yeah, they're um, right now they're on Del Mabry and, and Kennedy at the Veterans Cemetery and then down by West Shore Plaza um, on Kennedy just past West Shore uh, that marked the beginning and um, the Hillsborough end of Memorial Highway, uh, what was basically the extension of Kennedy Boulevard to, to Clearwater, really. Um, and that, by, by that the way, anybody's yep. just if anybody's just logging in, um, this is Rodney Kai Powell from uh, Tampa Bay History Center, who's talking about uh, prior pandemics. If you want to ask a question, if you're watching on your phone, post it underneath the, the video feed. If you're watching on your computer, post it to the right. We'll try to get them as many as we can. And also, we want to make sure that all this information is shared widely. That's the reason why we do it. So please share it uh, on your Facebook page with your friends and family. Thanks, Rodney. Back to you. Yeah, so uh, thanks, Bill. So, the, um, so yeah, so the, the main loss of life for World War I and, and Tampa residents was that the USS Tampa, the Coast Guard cutter that sank. Um, but, but yeah, there, if you include all the casualties, um, Army and, and Navy casualties, Coast Guard casualties, it, 200 sounds about right uh, for, for World War I casualties for, the, for Tampa Bay area residents. And so, yes, yeah, so you have another equal number of people die um, of this disease. And that, those numbers at two, uh, 283 was only for October and November of 1918. And so it's, it was a real, real severe epidemic that swept through. Um, this last uh, shot I have here from the epidemic is um, an advertisement for Father John's medicine. So people were taking advantage of uh, the situation by, by kind of selling patent medicine at the time. Um, I can't imagine what it would have done for you. Probably had cocaine or heroin or morphine, something like that in it, because um, that was available at the time. And then, you know, we talk about masks and it's obviously kind of a hot button issue, um, but there, there are a few folks, a few pictures of, of, of people wearing masks from um, 1918, 1919. Uh, these are uh, newspaper boys from North Florida. And then um, a, a group of uh, telephone operators. Uh, telephone operators were critically important uh, in the early years of, of the telephone system. And so these are all uh, Southern Bell telephone operators from Jacksonville. Um, and their, their job was essential in our, you know, in the province of our times. So, um, so they had to go to work, but they all wore masks. And it was um, kind of something we would see today. Um, moving on from, from the Spanish flu, I was thinking, you know, kind of how do I, you know, how do we make this a little more current um, than the Spanish flu, which was a hundred years ago. And so one of the things I, I thought about, and so how kind of I think we'll, will end unless there's questions, which is really happy to hear, um, was um, tuberculosis. And so that's not really talked about a whole lot, um, but the tuber tuberculosis is another communicable disease. Uh, it's a bacteria and it affects the lungs. And so it's similar to, to COVID-19. And, um, and there were hospitals that were set up by the state uh, in the 1950s to combat tuberculosis. And you could actually, the state had a law that you could commit somebody against their will if they had tuberculosis, regardless of, of their desire to, to enter the hospital. Um, this is a W.T. Edwards, a name that might be familiar uh, to, to people out there and people of, of my generation in Tampa see that uh, or hear that name and they think of the juvenile detention. 
But uh, prior to it, it being that, it was the tuberculosis hospital. And uh, interestingly, I didn't know this until doing research for this, all of the TB hospitals in Florida were named after W.T. Edwards, who is uh, one of the leading state health officials. I thought there was only one, but every one of them were, had the same name, which is kind of interesting, and all had the same architecture. Um, and um, and, and they're, they're, TB is still something that, that exists today. Um, it is still a disease that is being battled, although the numbers are, are far, far lower than it used to be. Um, but it's still an illness that that was long feared. It's, it's, it was called consumption. If you ever hear about somebody having consumption in the 19th century, uh, that's tuberculosis as well. Um, it's something that uh, that we haven't completely defeated medically, um, but it has gotten a lot better. And so these types of hospitals are, are no longer necessary. And so, um, you know, hope, a little bit of hope, you know, for us as uh, we go through this. Y'all have any, uh, any Great. questions? Well, if, if anybody online has any questions, like I said, you can post it underneath the feed or to the right, depending on how you're watching it. In the meantime, um, I'm sure Dell and I have lots of questions in the yes. next 10 minutes here. Dell, you want to start? Well, uh, one of the things, in addition to TB, and I remember that uh, WT Edwards Hospital, it's where the HCC, Dale Mabry <laughs> campus is now. Exactly. Uh, and uh, I was a kid, but, uh, you know, I think, if, as you said, when if you were diagnosed, you didn't have a choice. That's where you went. And then that mm -hmm. was the way it was spread. Another disease that I remember as a very small child uh, and the fear of it was polio during the summer yeah. months. Yeah, exactly. And, yeah, my grandfather had, had polio. Um, he survived it, but um, it affected him the rest of his life. And that absolutely, um, until there was a vaccine for polio, it was an incredibly feared a disease because um, it, it, you know, is, is a, a disease of paralysis. Um, and so it, including, of course, paralyzing your, your respiratory system, but um, it affected my grandfather and many others um, by, by limiting the use of his legs. And so even though he survived it, it um, was still something that was di very difficult on, on people. And so you're absolutely right, Dell. That was a greatly feared disease. Uh, I was about nine years old when the vaccine became available. And I remember my parents taking me downtown to the health department for the vaccination because that was a tremendous fear of all parents. So we've, yeah. we've lived through these before. You have that scar still on your, on your arm? No, that, that was leads smallpox. To... Oh, well, I, th I thought polio did too. I thought polio left kind and of, and the earlier ones left kind of a nasty it was, It's gone, but I remember it, uh, <laughs> you know, the, I'm going to my twenties, it stuck around. Yeah. We've, got a, we've got a question from the floor. We got a question from the floor and Rodney, in the meantime, you might want to um, take the presentation down. Yep, just did. Um, uh, we got a question from the floor. Why has the economy taken such a hit today when it seemed to be okay during the Spanish flu? Is that because the economy today is so different or were different measures taken? I, I think it's the, the level of, of shelter in place that, um, that was enacted for, for, for today, COVID-19, as opposed to the Spanish flu. But also the economy is, was different. Um, but you know, one thing that didn't close during the Spanish flu, um, I keep calling it that, I shouldn't call it that, um, was this, in Tampa, the cigar factories. The cigar factories uh, remained open, and um, but it also likely led to the much higher death rate and infection rate. Um, but um, but you, you had the closing of schools, uh, just like we do today, and, um, and that was certainly a, a, a big consideration. But you didn't have this, just the almost complete shutdown of our economy uh, to like like you do today, um, but well, there, there definitely was a limitation. What were the main drivers of the economy back then? The cigar it? industry was was huge then, as was phosphate shipping out of the port and lumber shipping out of the port, and so um, of course the tobacco came in and cigars came out of the port as well. Um, but the the cigar industry uh, was the main driver for for Tampa's economy. Uh, we had you know we were a bit of a banking center, a business center. Um, but uh, without a doubt, it was that cigar industry. We, we had hardly any tourist economy to speak of. Uh, not how, big, how big was our economy at um, late 1800s compared to Key West and Miami? So, um, so Tampa had just kind of taken the, the lead over Key West uh, in the 1890s. And so we were, Tampa's funny as far as you look at that kind of population numbers and, and the size of the city. We've always been geographically small, uh, I guess, until uh, Greco, you know, annexed a lot of, of, of North Tampa back in the 90s, we've been very, very geographically small. 
Um, so if you, when you include the suburbs, um, Tampa was generally beginning around 1900 and consistently through the 20th century, um, kind of second, third largest city in the state. Uh, there may have been a little bit of time where we were the, the largest, um, but always buying with either Jacksonville and Pensacola or of course Miami um, beginning in the 1920s for the, the status of the, the biggest and most important city in the state. But, but kind of traditionally Jacksonville, Miami and Tampa have always, are, are the big three. Um, someone posted a comment, not a question. She says her neighbor failed to vaccinate his young son for polio and his son became paralyzed from the disease. He obviously regretted that his whole life. It's so important yeah. to vaccinate. Yeah, of course, that's what we're all waiting for. You know, that's the thing, you know, people ask, you know, rightly, when can things get back to normal, you know, if we ever find what a, a new normal is. And, and you know, vaccine, um, short of, of knowing that, uh, you can gain an immunity and a, a long-term immunity uh, to it. That's the key. And so being able to, to know that you're vaccinated and, and safe from it, um, that, that's how things will get back to normal. We had, um, we had one of my friends from Panama watching a few minutes ago. Um, and so I'll <laughs> ask this question. Uh, did Balboa ever come in this area or just? Did... No, just down there. Okay. Yeah, we, we had um, kind of our big three were, uh, of course, uh, Ponce de Leon, who didn't make it quite this far north. Uh, Panfila de Narvaez, and then Hernando de Soto. So those were our guys. And then actually, um, Pedro Menendez de Aviles, the guy who founded St. Augustine, he made it to Tampa too in 1566, uh, tried to start a, a, a colony about where Safety Harbor is, um, but it didn't succeed. But Tell if it me. did, we'd be second oldest city in the state. Tell everybody real fast about the Diary of Esteban. You all have a little um, uh, display about that, but can yeah. you see? And, and it's actually kind of timely because I just saw uh, in the Times that, uh, that Richard Gonsmart's putting Eulalie back uh, on the Riverwalk or near the Riverwalk. And so, um, so yeah, so with the Narvaez expedition in 1528, uh, it was a you know brutal, awful um, expedition that ended up in uh, Mexico, but only four survivors. Um, but there was a, a guy, one of the guy, one of those four survivors was an African born man named Esteban, the, the, likely the first African born, um, first of African descent to cross the country. Uh, he did that with uh, um, three others, uh, one of them being um, Cabeza de Vaca, who wrote the, uh, the whole story of that journey down. And then looking for these people, though, particularly looking for Narvaez, was this guy named Juan Ortiz, who came to, to the area a year later, uh, trying to find what happened to them. And, um, and he and his, or his companions were all killed. Ortiz was was taken captive, and so sort of the story goes, was his life was spared by the chief's daughter, whose name was Eulalie, which is where the restaurant name comes from, and where the, the statue that, that that Richard's putting back on the Riverwalk is named for him. It's in the story of Eulalie and Juan Ortiz is very similar to the Pocahontas John Smith story, uh, only ours happened a hundred plus years earlier. Yeah, and it's so interesting that those four um, escaped and in over ten years made it all the way yeah. around. To Mexico and the Pacific and, side of Mexico, uh, yeah, it is, it's just incredible. Um, what else? Uh, we have a couple more minutes. Any other cool um, history bits you can throw at us? Any anything about Tampa that we would like to know but we don't know? Well, I want to ask Ronnie a question. Getting back to the pandemic and the Tampa Bay Hotel. Yeah, uh, did the Tampa Bay Hotel remain open during uh, the pandemic? Well, so it, it, th that's actually a great point, though, because Tampa Bay Hotel, which is now University of Tampa. Um, was really the landmark hotel in Tampa, but its history, its importance, I should say, for as far as a hotel, uh, fits right between the two great uh, epidemics. The last yellow fever epidemic, like I said, ended in 1888. And it was at that time that Henry Plant announced that not only was he not gonna leave Tampa for a healthier environment, because he's the one who brought the railroad here, he was going to build this resort hotel. So he kind of doubled down on Tampa. And, and showed how much faith he has in, this, in, in, this, in the city. And he built the Tampa Bay Hotel. But by the time of the, uh, the uh, flu epidemic of 1918 and 1919, the hotel, which was you know, the first thing in, in opulence, uh, had become passe. And the city had already acquired it. And it was a city hotel that, um, that was being used not just seasonally by wealthy Northeasterners, but was being used year round by kind of your more ordinary traveler. And as far as I know, the hotel remained open the whole time. Uh, I, I honestly don't know. You can contact the Plant Museum, 
um, they, they probably have a better sense of, of, of their history during the, the um, flu epidemic of 1918 and 1919. But I, I, I don't think that they closed. Um, they, Rodney, they had, we're out of time. And I, I so we okay. so appreciate you doing this. You come to talk to us about once or twice a year and people always ask you more questions. And so we'll have to have you back to do one of these online ones again too. Um, okay. If anybody is just watching or watching later, uh, please uh, share with your friends and family on Facebook or wherever, because uh, the purpose the reason why we do this is to share information widely. And Tampa's got, and the Tampa area's got such a rich history. We need to continue to tell more of these stories. And we just barely touched on this today. Uh, nice. Thank you, Mel, and welcome back. Uh, Rodney, any, any final thoughts or words or websites you want to tell us about? Well, yeah, so I got to plug the History Center. Uh, we opened uh, back up June 1st. So please go to our website, uh, tampahistorycenter.org, or give us a call. Um, you, you can kind of rewind a little bit and see those slides. I have the website and the phone number. Um, we've got a whole list of things that we're doing to keep everybody as safe as we can. Of course, nothing's 100%. But we want to, um, to, to show and, and tell everybody kind of what we're doing. And if they're curious about what it's going to be like coming back to the History Center, just, just give us a call or go on, online and come back and see us June 1st. Great. Thank you so much again. And uh, thanks, Del. We'll see you. Thank you.